All right, I'm John Johansson. Uh, I'm the publisher of Maine Coastal News. I live in Winterport, Maine. And uh, basically, Maine Coastal News is my, uh, I guess what you'd call it the bread and butter uh, that allows me to do all of the other crazy things I do. Uh, Maine Coastal News is a, a newspaper that is published uh, regarding uh, the boating on the coast of Maine. And it mostly deals with uh, lots of boats, boat builders, uh, that sort of thing. But it also has a strong uh, tinge of history to it. I have taken uh, over the years, probably 35 plus years, I have copied out hundreds of articles of, uh, from newspapers. And it's amazing what, of course, is in newspapers. So I use that as sometimes filler, but come to find out, most people, that's what they want to read. <laughs> so it's really helped the newspaper. So we keep doing it. So you operate the International Maritime Library. Can you yeah. tell us what that is? Well, it's a nonprofit. And the way it came about was I had gone into a house, somebody was uh, trying to get rid of some maritime books. And I said, well, what was he doing? Because he, of course, had passed away. And they said, well, I, we think he was writing a book. And I says, well, where's all the papers that he would have been compiling? They said, oh, we threw them out. And I started to wonder how many times does this happen? And I don't mean just in the marine business, but all the time. Somebody comes in to clean out a house and either they don't know or they don't care and they just push everything into a dumpster. Now, I just had to clean out a house and I understand the problems that you can have. You know, you got time constraints, you got space constraints. But the house I was cleaning out was my uncle's house, who was a shipwreck diver in Cape Cod and basically the Massachusetts and Rhode Island area. And he was one of the forerunners. He had started way, way back. And he, would, in fact, had worked with Dr. Harold Edgerton at MIT, who developed what he called the penetrator, but we know it today as side scan sonar. So, you know, and I got to meet him when I was a kid. I didn't really realize who he was. And I kind of knew some of the things he had done and they knew he was important, but, you know, I was very young when I met him. Uh, but that's what really kicked me off. And the other thing is, there's no one place that has put together all of the periodicals that are published. Now, when you really think about this, and I really didn't give it much thought at the time, it's too massive a ta uh, of a task for one person to really do. And even if you break some of the aspects of it down, even the aspects are too big for one person to do. As you know, I mean, you know, you, you're doing databasing like I am. Nobody in their right mind would do this, <laughs> you know, because it takes a lot of time to get all of the information. And, you know, you got to go through book after book after book because you don't know where it's coming from, you know, that it's going to fill in that next blind. And some of the most obscure little pamphlets I found in my uncle's collection were some of the best. He had had pamphlets from Cape Cod on Highland Light, which was one of the uh, places that a lot of shipwrecks occurred out on the end of Cape Cod that, you know, actually told a lot of stuff that's not, not available any other place. So when did you start? How long have you been well, doing this? Well, the database and I started probably around 1990. So I've been doing it 30, 32 years. And the reason I did it was because I realized that on the Penobscot River, I started to look for some of the, the vessels that had been built there. And I went down to the Penobscot Marine Museum, which is in Searsport, and I went through the Appleby collection. Robert Appleby was a uh, custom house officer in Stockton Springs. And he did a lot of data collecting. And of course, when he did it, there was no computers. He died in the early 80s. But he had been a custom house official, I think, for over 40 years. And he saved a lot of the WPA studies. Now, I'm not sure if you've seen WPA studies. There is some from out your way. There's one that was done in Oregon, I believe, or two that were done out in Oregon. But they were Workers' Project Administration, which was in the early 30s to get people back to work 
during the depression, they started putting these people to, to work doing documentation. And one of the things was doing custom house records. And, you know, this is one of your best sources for information. Although, as you know, some of it's not accurate either, <laughs> you know, but you can sometimes get a general idea of what's not accurate and what is. So I got the brilliant idea and it helped the Penobscot Marine Museum at the time. So I took all of Applebee's collection and actually computerized it, which took a long time. I have a woman that works with me, Rachel Elwood. She actually works on the newspaper, but when we have downtime and the paper doesn't really demand a full-time 40 hour a week position for, you know, all the time. So she actually is typing a lot of transcription from either newspapers or custom house records or whatever. And uh, I'm sure she gets bored to death because I think right now she's working in the New York Maritime Reporter. And that started in about 1868. And it's got a, just a mass of information inside it. Some of the launchings, some of the stuff that's going on in the shipping world, comings and goings out of the port of New York, that sort of thing. And some of the stuff all over the world. So, you know, that's where I started and it just kept growing. But then I was at Mystic Seaport one time in Connecticut. And I said that what we really need to do is take the merchant vessel list and, comp and compile each vessel from each annual into one entry. And somebody said, well, nobody would dare do that. Well, I was dumb enough to do it. I'm Norwegian, you know, we, we're kind of, you know, hard headed and stubborn. So what I did is I took the pre-list, which was published in 1867, and went up to 1885. And the reason I went to 85 was because that was when they started putting in the measurements. So I compiled all of that. It took about 6,000 hours to do. And then went back and handed him a CD. And then he goes, what's this? And I said, well, that's what you told somebody wouldn't do. And I'm not sure how well it got used at the time. But now that's the basis of my database. But I've expanded it an awful lot over the years to a lot more fields. I think there's almost a hundred fields now. And you could go, depending on how far you want to break things down, as you know, you know, do you want to put the rig in? Do you want to put the measurements of the rig in? <laughs> and look at all the measurements that you can have for a rig, you know? So, you know, there has to be some sort of limitations, I think, but some of us, we don't, we're not good at that. So we just keep putting in the data, but that's kind of where it all started. Are you still, uh, carrying out the recording the same way now as when you started, or has this evolved no. over time? Yeah, it evolves, as you probably know. You know, all of a sudden you, you'll say, geez, we need another field. And, you know, to capture more information, make it a lot easier for, say, somebody who's searching data. You know, I worry that, because I've got notes in the background that, you compile, say, from Applebee's stuff. Well, I've expanded all of Applebee's work, so you put it up online, but do you hide it so that people can still search it, you know? Because that would give them the references uh, to know exactly where everything comes from. But that's another monumental task. If you started doing that for every vessel, right now I'm up over 150,000 vessels, I think, in the next update you know, where do you draw the line? You know, there's only so many <laughs> days we have on this earth, you know, and it's, you know, you don't have enough. I don't care how you divide it up. I was told that when I first started, somebody says, well, you won't live long enough. And if you, and somebody said, well, if you, if you do the math, you won't. So I don't do the math. How do you uh, go about your work? You're working at a computer. Do you have yep. a do you have an online form that you're filling out or you're working with a database program? What, what, how do you go about it? I use Excel. Now, somebody told me I couldn't use Access. They didn't think that it would hold it. Now, I don't know because I don't know enough about databasing and stuff, but this came from a guy that did a lot of databasing in Boston. He worked for a major company down there. But uh, so what I do is I use Excel, which has limitations too, and so, you know, I don't think you can put, but only so many characters per field that, and that could be a problem. Uh, but a lot of times when there's like, I can find the owners, I list the major owner and then put 
E-G-A-L after it, you know, so that they know that there's more. But that's a problem, too. You really should be able to list every owner. It's like crew list. And finding crew list, as you know, is probably one of the hardest things to do. Uh, you almost have to go to insurance documents to get some of that. And uh, But anyway, so that's basically how I do it is with Excel. And I just go through and and for material, I'm mostly using annuals. So I use the list of merchant vessels primarily. And I use that as the default. Is that and merchant then, vessels of the U.S.? Yes. And so then I go to the American Lloyds, which was published in the early, in the 1860s up into the 1870s. And you do that because you've got more fields, you've got captains, you've got other things in that, that the list of merchant vessels doesn't do. And then I use, uh, uh, well, the record from the American Bureau of Shipping. And then I also use Lloyds. And then I try to combine them, but th now you've got another horror show because when you combine a lot of these lists, they don't line up. You know, the measurements are different. And of course, you know, you gotta be careful of the change in measurements that happened in the 1860s, you know, which they denote as old measurements as opposed to the new ones that they wrote in 1860. So, and that should be explained somewhere in the database of what, how they do the measurements and how that's all put together. Well. Wow. Now, do you focus entirely on U United States vessels or? No. Because the vessels are not confined by borders. They're being sold back and forth, for example, between Canada and the U.S. and, and the United States and Mexico and many, many, many other countries. No, you can't. You know, especially here in Maine, you know, we have a lot of vessels that came from Canada and a lot of our vessels went up to Canada. So, you know, you get into Canadian list, you see vessels that were built, say, in Essex, Massachusetts, or on this coast up there as fishing vessels. So, and then you've got a lot of them that were sold abroad, you know, all over Europe, especially at, during the Civil War. A lot of our vessels were sold out and because of insurance rates. So, no, I've actually gone to, the, to a degree that wasn't smart in a lot of ways, but it doesn't bother me. I mean, I don't mind not being able to finish this. A lot of people have to finish projects, but my look at it is, is that it's like eating an elephant. You know, you eat one bite at a time and just keep going. And when, you know, you can't do it anymore, you hope somebody else will pick it up. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, you've got a gray beard. I've got gray hair. Yep. Uh, both of us are working on something that will outlast us, what, <laughs> we hope. what are you planning to do with your database? Well, I'm right now, I'm the uh, president of the board at the Penobscot Marine Museum. And I think that museums today need to look very carefully at how they survive. Because as we know, a lot of the younger generations uh, are not that in love with history as much as I'd like to see them. Uh, I'm not sure that that won't come back. It seems to always wax and wane a little bit, but you know, how is say something like the Penobscot Marine Museum going to last? Because that was founded on big ships. Uh, Searsport was a capital of deep sea captains. There was a number of captains and they claimed to be the, the most prevalent town in the United States and having the most deep sea captains per capita. I'm not sure that that's true. It's like a lot of numbers you see on, you know, <laughs> use like how many shipwrecks occurred in a year. Well, I want to see the list of those shipwrecks so I can prove that your number's right. But, you know, so if you're founded on big ships, you know, you can't survive on that today because the big ships are gone. The families are all broken up. A lot of the kids or grandkids or great grandkids, they no longer understand that grandfather sailed around the world and what he did. Now, some may get interested in that, but you know, how deep will that interest go? And would they support a maritime museum? And so what I've done at the museum is tried to push them into lobster boats, get the commercial fishermen, get them interested, 
get the businesses interested because this is a museum for them. But you also have to look at how else you're going to make money. How are you going to bring in more revenue? And I think it's through intellectual property. So we have an incredible collection of, uh, of uh, photographs. There's about 300,000 images. I'm probably going to dump on them because of what I do. I've saved all the photographs I've ever shot on the coast of Maine, and I'm probably over 150,000. And, you know, all my interviews, which is well over 500 of them on people who are long gone now, they're going to go to the museum. So when you take all of this and you can put it into a video or some sort of media that people can actually enjoy online, now you've got intellectual property and people see what you're doing and why they need to support it. And, you know, we have been doing it. In fact, I just recently released uh, an interview I did with Glenn Holland, who's a lobster boat builder in Belfast, Maine. And he's one of the characters of the coast because he's great for uh, quotes. Uh, some of them you have to edit out, <laughs> some of them you don't, but he's always fun to interview. So he was the first one and somebody claimed it should go viral, but I don't think it's going to go viral. But anyways, it, it gave us a big step up because of that interview. It brought more people to the website for Maine Bill Boats. And then of course, we'll use that also uh, at the museum and that will get more people to understand what the museum's doing. Do you have any mentors, people who have been helping you along the way, either on the database side or on the historical side? I think, you know, I've looked at people in the past and I know a lot of writers, uh, you know, like I said before, Robert Appleby, you know, you saw what he did and you knew what kind of problem he had. He spent most of his time typing. Whereas you and I, we're lucky. If we need to correct something or add something or take something out, we can easily do it. He couldn't. He actually had to spend time typing that whole thing over. And I think in the later years, he started actually turning the page over and typing on the backside so that he didn't have to type it. You know, so I think in a lot of respects, we're, you know, and, and it's so much faster to use the computer to, you know, do data entry and that sort of thing. And I think it's sad that some of the writers in the, say, the 20s and 30s didn't have that ability because I think a lot more about history especially maritime, would have been saved. You know, I know a lot of the people is uh, Captain Doug Lee, who sailed the Schooner Heritage until a couple of years ago when he retired and sold the boat, but he's one of the best at schooners. So when I got pictures of schooners or whatever, I've got questions, you know, I can turn around and go ask him. I, Maynard Bray is one of the guys that's always after me. He actually, uh, I'm not sure you know who Maynard is. He was the curator at Mystic Seaport for a number of years. And now he's he's still a technical editor, I believe, for Wooden Boat Magazine. In the back of the magazine of Wooden Boat, there's a boat, save this boat, because it's you know getting ready to be cut up. Well, he's the one that writes those articles. And he wants me to bring in my photographs. And he actually said, I will work on your photographs to get them all cataloged because his collection has come through the museum because he believes in what they they are doing because everything in our collection is available. And I don't want anything that I've got or give to them not to be available. I want you to be able to come in and see a half hall, see a photograph, see whatever. And, you know, maybe you have to pay a, a nominal fee to use it, but make it nominal so that everybody can enjoy this stuff. Because what good is it if it's locked behind four walls? I couldn't agree more. This has obviously cost you a lot of money out of pocket over the years. <laughs> well, you can write a lot of it off, you know, as a, as a business expense when you own a newspaper and you claim that you, you're using it in, in the newspaper, which you are, you know. So, you know, I get, you know, I probably travel about 40,000 miles a year. The last year I did almost 50. I was just shy by like, I don't know, 72 miles, 20 something miles, I think. 70 miles. But anyway, you know, but I end up in places that I enjoy. You know, I go to Mystic Seaport usually once a year. And, you know, I, I chase things down uh, on Cape Cod and try to meet up with people because I think interviews, I think we as a, as a people have made major errors in not documenting 
a lot of the people who are here now because they are the history. You know, last year I interviewed the Kelseys from South Bristol, who was an old fisherman and his brother actually worked at the shipyard in town, which is known as Gamage Yard. And he just passed away, one of them. So I was glad I was able to get his take on South Bristol, which is one of the major fishing ports and shipbuilding places on the coast of Maine. How do you relate to the what I call the professional historians, the academic historians? How, how do they view your work? I don't know. <laughs> A lot of, you know, it's funny because Ann Bray, which was Maynard's wife who passed away about three or four years ago, she always said, stay away from people with, <laughs> with letters after their name. <laughs> And I think she ran into problems, but I've never really run into problems. I think if you prove that you do the research properly and they'll understand that. Now they don't like people like me who use newspapers, but I think that's wrong. I think newspapers, especially back in the 1800s, early 1900s, the people who wrote the maritime columns, they were professionals. They knew the maritime world inside and out. And so I think it's a mistake not to take them. I mean, you got to be careful of any piece of information you get. Yes, even professional historians, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look at Chappelle. There was a big question about what Chappelle did. There was a lot of things. There was a big conference we had at Mystic Seaport one year, probably in the early 90s, mid 90s. And there was a talk on Chappelle who you have to admire what he saved. He saved so much material at the Smithsonian, but somebody would, they were actually documenting it and said, well, sometimes when he didn't know, say what the stern looked like, he'd draw it in. But I'm sure with all of the knowledge that he had, he was probably closer than he wasn't. So is it wrong? And then there was another guy in this state that he collected photographs. And unfortunately, he collected them sometimes nefariously. And, but his photographs are now available to everybody, whereas otherwise they never would have been. They may have been actually completely lost. So, you know, I, I don't think academics look at what I do with a bad eye. You know, they will if I have a lot of mistakes, I'm sure. But you, as you know, you try to limit them. You know, I go through and double check a lot of the stuff before it goes up online. And, and it gets corrected later too, as people point out the errors. Yeah, I don't get many people to write me, you know, but I'm not sure that that's because they, they haven't tried or because the thing's not set up properly to email me. Uh, I get buried under an avalanche. I get, you know, 50 or 60 emails a day, quite often pointing out corrections uh, right and, and which is good because I don't have the I don't have the ability or the time to go back and keep checking and checking and rechecking right. and other people are scrutinizing my work and saying either hey you got a typo here or, or you've actually got it wrong this is mm -hmm. the information that should be should be in the in that spot so and I'm grateful for it you know one thing I tried to do like when I was doing the merch the list of merchant vessels, when I went from year to year, if it changed, I would go back to the previous one to make sure that I had made a mistake. And there were times that yes, I had. And for the most part, sometimes it was their mistake because they had changed it. And then a few issues later, they changed it back, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, I try to put a lot of safeguards in for that <laughs> to, to keep the, uh, the number of mistakes down. Now I'll put the the internet address for the International Maritime Library up for viewers, but yep. can you um, tell us how viewers can access your site? Uh, uh, is it is there a cost? Is there a fee? No, nope. uh, it's all free. I believe that if you start charging, you start limiting who's going to look at it. So you you almost have to do it free and find other ways to get your revenue if you need it. You know, I'm lucky that it's, it's just time I've got invested. 
you know, it's not really costing me much. The uh, website guy did my website at a very, very reasonable rate. I'm not sure it's the best way it should have been done. You know, maybe at some point they're going to tell me, you know, you really need to do this another way to make it more available and easier to search. Uh, but I'll, I'm prepared for that. But uh, I also think that I need to get up, as you have done, you know, you've started to list, you, you list people, you know, and, that, and I think we also need to put in a, what I call the notopedia, or I think it, that's what I call it, maropedia. And to start putting in, say, like some old, old dictionaries, and so that people can search them to understand how the meaning of certain things have come up through the ages. But now, do you have any uh, uh, last words to our for our uh, for our viewers? Well, I'll do as much as I can as long as I can. So far, I'm doing okay. You know, uh, it just comes down to a matter of time because I can still do Maine Coastal News. I've done it now for 35 years. It's not a very difficult job, but it's also one that I feel like the. Uh, like doing the database is that it, it should be done because there's only one other person on the coast that sort of does what I do. He does only commercial. It's Brian Robbins from Commercial Fisheries News. And he documents people and boats, but only commercial, whereas I'll do anything. I don't care. And uh, but between us, you know, we've covered a lot of ground saving the history on the main coast. But see, I also go outside of Maine. And so doesn't he, he actually, their publication will do all in New England, but only commercial. But it's almost too bad that they don't go out and do big interviews with old timers and stuff. And they do, but they're limited. You've done an internationally significant job on this, John. Congratulations. And I hope, well, uh, I hope uh, uh, all of our viewers will check into your website and uh, use your information and uh, communicate with you. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.